planned a message, a completely different message, uh, inspired by, <laughs> wow, this is good, uh, always inspired by God, but inspired by the things that I see going on in the church world. I wanted to deliver a message to you, which I think God wants me to wait on, because he kind of redirected me to bring you a, a message you've heard before. Sometimes we need to just bring out some of those messages we're real familiar with. Um, I don't want to say necessarily the compass point, but sometimes just to get back to those places which we absolutely have come to know are true. Following the path of faith isn't easy. Anybody want to argue that with me? How many here are in the sanctuary? It's okay. No one's going to put a camera on you. I'm looking at you. God's looking down. How many here today have that little bit of fear about the unknown uncertainty of tomorrow? And tragically, I think, what would it be if we didn't have the tools we have, and imagine we have those tools, and we still get butterflies or that stomach that just tenses up where you just say, oh, what is going to happen? In fact, we all have perfected the Gideon language. Oh, how, why, huh? Even though we know, we've been through it, it seems so many times, walked where we know God has wanted us to go, and yet, still, Tomorrow can be scary. And if we're, if we're really realistic with ourselves, truthful with ourselves, no one can know exactly what tomorrow is going to bring. Most of us spend much time fussing about it. The truth of the matter is God already knows. He's got, as the song we used to sing, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know he holds my hand. He's going to lead me. He knows about tomorrow. So today I want us to really focus on something that might calm the nerves, give a little peace. It's, a, it's an old message here in this church, but I want us to see it afresh today. So if you will, turn to Genesis 12. The old timers know what I'm doing, and you who are here for the first time or newer will hear something that has been preached here over the better part of 35 plus years, a message on the life of faith by the patriarch. Abraham. Now, what I want to be different today, when I really felt that the Lord redirected my feet to be planted right here, I wanted to make sure that as I kind of obeyed God, I think kind of, I use that as a qualifier, that I was sure to emphasize certain things that we can say, oh yeah, I know this. And yet, when the moment comes, we forget the most important thing, following the path of faith, which is what I've labeled this first part of this message, really begins with God calling Abram out of Ur of Chaldees. Now, what is interesting to me is I'd never really focused too much on the chronology I always focused on how long it took for God to make good on the promise he gave to Abram, becoming Abraham, having the child of promise. But I never really looked at and focused on the timeline before. And you have to read in the previous chapter to see that Terah, who is Abram's father. Uh, when God says, get up out of your land, leave your kindred, and so forth, that's from you've almost got to read behind the 12th chapter, its logical order. But more interesting is that we know the names of people and places are significant. The fact that they, it says in verse 31, that they all went forth from Ur of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came unto Haran, which means halting, and dwelt there. And the days of Terah, that is Abram's father, were 205 years. And Terah 
died in Haran. He died in halting in Haran. And I thought, you know, that could just be a message by itself if I never went any further, which is a lot of people don't know the background to Terah who worshipped idols in his land. In fact, if you read in the apocryphal writing, which I just happen to have with me, uh, the book of Jasher. And some people say, well, that's not, that's not a canonical book. Well, it's certainly mentioned both in Joshua and in Samuel. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? And I might say parenthetically, Jasher is not a person. The name Yashar in Hebrew means upright or straight. People get that confused and they think, oh, who's Jasher? Who is Jasher in the Bible? Uh, it means upright in Hebrew, yashar. But in this book, which is apocryphal, which, by the way, once may have been a part of our Bible at some point and then was removed because the apocryphal was at one time included in the Bible and then removed, you read of the story of what is not included in the book of Genesis, how that Terah, Abraham's father, worshipped idols, how that Abraham's or Abram's life coincides in the timeline with Noah and Shem, the antediluvian folks, that if you read the history of Abraham's birth or Abram's birth, Nimrod, who was that evil person, he sought to kill Abram. He sought to terminate him, knowing if you want to say it's the forces of good and evil always going at it, but if you read in this book of Jasher, you find that there's a lot more than just the fact that Terah, Abram's father, who worshipped idols, followed as far as Haran. They left a certain land and followed as far as Haran. And most people don't look at the Bible land and they think, well, that must be not a big deal. That's a couple hundred miles, by the way, from where they started to where he died, that pilgrimage is a couple of hundred miles or kilometers, whatever you're, you're uh, calculating in. But Terah died in Haran. And I love the fact that because names mean something, and I know a lot of people like this, they start out on a journey, they come to a place where they halt, and that's, a, that's exactly it. The dying starts at the place where you halt, if you stay halted in God's program and don't move forward in faith. Now, that could be my message, but it's not. I thought, boy, that would be a delightful message. I need to preach on that one day. But all of these, you know, you, I never get tired of reading these passages because each time I read them, they, they shore up afresh. They give me a fresh footing. They connect me once more with God's way of doing things. So chapter 12 opens with, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. And some here may understand this in part. Some may understand who are, who are not born here, who are not natives of this country, who know what it is to come out of your land and journey into a land where you really don't know what it's going to be like and what the people are going to be like and how you're going to live. Most of the people that I'm talking to right now will never have to face that in reality, but we are all that in type. That's the disconnect. Well, I'm not a, an immigrant. I'm not just passing through. I, I, I've lived here all my life, but this is not your home. As a Christian, this is not your home. And we are just like Abram or Abraham, the city that we cannot see, that we will obtain one day. And there may be a little bit of nerves along the way, not knowing the how-to. The roadmap isn't exactly, it doesn't say, you are here like the map at the mall, and to get to there, you got to go that way. We don't have that. The best we have is this book that's given to us, that's the you are here, and you want to get to there? you got to go through this book. And so I think I relate to this, probably beyond what most people would, to get out of where your comfort zone is. 
Now that's the beginning of the path of faith, to get out of your comfort zone. People have used this many times as the license and as the excuse to uh, cut off family and friends and, well, I'm, I'm following Jesus away from you. <laughs> That's not what the scripture means. Simply, and we can bring it into the New Testament, that is if you prefer your family over Christ, that is not that you must cut off, but if you prefer them over Christ, that's what Christ's uh, admonition to those who could hear was, to prefer him first, that he must have preeminence. So uh, all of this first verse rivets me, and I think some people read this and they think, well, didn't he obey? The book of Hebrews says that he set out, in that 11th chapter he set out, and he obeyed. Well, that's the beginning part of his story. And I think we all want to start off like that. We hear God's word and we get giddy to say, yeah, until we get going and realize it's not easy. That's why I wrote that up there. Following the path of faith is not easy. And in fact, the lessons sometimes that God will teach us are downright miserable. They're just so hard to receive. This is a great example. God gives us great promise. I'll make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, if you just stop there and you only had that portion, and you jump forward to thou shalt be a blessing, and then he passes his wife off as his sister, uh, I don't know what type of blessing that was because the Pharaoh was smart enough to say, are you trying to curse me? So... I don't think that was the blessing intended right there, but God says, I'll bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, and I've, I've got some words. My, my roadmap is a little bit scary. All the words in blue are the, the words, his action words. Uh, Get thee out, departed, they went forth passed through. I took all the action words to show that the life of faith, for the most part, is it is like from faith to faith. It is a constant movement, but it must be in God's direction, in God's way. We can have a lot of movement doing a lot of stuff which is not God's way. Put a halo around it and say, see, it's good, huh? Which is what I've said a lot of the activity in the church world is, just a lot of activity. So, it says, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. There is that great sense of obedience. He departed as the Lord had said, and Lot went with him. Now, as you know, Lot, you've got to read back there in the genealogies in the 11th chapter. You read that Lot is relative to Abram. And when we say that Lot went with him, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of lots in the world. There's a lot of people who just want a free ride on your faith. I'm just now uncovering that as a believer. There are a whole lot of people that want to latch on to me because they say, oh, you're so strong in the faith and you love God so much. Let me, let me just latch on to you, but they don't want to have to walk by faith. They want to walk by my tailcoat and pull me down. Any of you know people like that? They just want a free ride. They don't want to have to do any of the faithing. They don't want to have to do any work. And they think, as long as they're latched on to me, they're safe. Well, we better look out, because I'm a little reckless. <laughs> and I've warned you. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, this is what's remarkable. He died at 175 years of age. He, he started off on that journey from Haran, not from Ur, but from Haran at 75, died at 175. So he spent 100 years of his life just wandering here and there and here and there. And you think you have a problem? You think you, you know, this is what we spend a lot of our time, believe it or not, 
it is a huge worry when people say, I'm concerned because I don't know where I'm going to live and I don't know how things are going to be and I want stability in my life. Do you read that Abram had stability? A hundred years of wandering all over the map. And that's why I say sometimes we need to get a reality check. These are the compass points. We need to get a reality check. We sit in church and we say, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I need some stability in my life. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And what's, what's horrible is we, we, I'm not talking about some other church, we sing these songs and we still have the knots and the butterflies and the oh my goodness and here comes Gideon again. I, you know, I should have, I wish I would have named Newman Gideon. <laughs> then I could have kept referring to Gideon all the time. Newman is my little dog. He's not so little anymore, by the way. He likes food now. He's discovered that food, unlimited food, begging for food, now he's got a belly. <laughs> Gluttonous dog. He was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance they had gathered, and all the souls, all the people they had gotten in Haran. That means they acquired, produced, whatever you want to say, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Now I know the book of Hebrews Chapter 11, verse 8 says, he went out not knowing whether he went. And that, that could be a whole sermon, too, on the way some people see the life of faith. They have no clue of where they're going. They're, 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 they don't even have the Bible as the compass point. And they really do fit the bill of not knowing whether they, whether they, whether they went. They're just going somewhere. I like the fact that following the directives, they came into the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land of under the place of Shechem, or Sishem, under the plain of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. <laughs> now that's a good one. You know, we tend to read right over this. The Canaanite was in the land, which the land was not settled. There was a very angry and tumultuous place. But God says, This is your consolation prize. No, he says... He says, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, which is meaning house of God, Bethel, two words in the Hebrew, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now in the many times I listened to this message that Dr. Scott preached and to the many times that I really took this in. It never really registered. His emphasis, of course, was on the fact that uh, everywhere that Abraham marked a place, he built an altar and he also pitched a tent. And his famous saying was that most people spend more time building tents and pitching altars. But it never dawned on me until just recently as I was reading this, that the fact of the matter is, if you think about it, where we read in the New Testament, Jesus came, he tented himself in human flesh, dwelt among us, and we, we reach from that and we somehow with different eyes remove the understanding that this tent, this tent signifies just the temporary clothing, the temporary garments we wear in our pilgrimage and the willingness to move from place to place as God wills and designs and clears the way for us to go. So much of our life is spent trying to bolt down and make sure we are not moved. Now, I'm not suggesting that we become gypsies and move about like that, but I am saying that when God is directing your path, be careful not to get too fixated on the time side of the equation because the temporal to be in view requires you see the tent. You understand what the tent is for. Now, tents are put up and taken down real quickly. And that's the way life is, too, our life here. 
very delicate. So when that point was made, it, it seems significant to me that in the telling of this, I also thought the tent maker of the New Testament, who really grasped the whole picture, referred back to Abraham and referred back to the fact that Abraham amened God, that it was imputed or accounted to him for righteousness. He understood about the temporary factors that he endured while he was pressing towards a city, the city of God. Sometimes I think we get so focused on building something that is so solid we forget temporary. And the altars we erect, they're designed for sacrifice and worship. Now, he didn't build an altar here and say, I'm opening up a coffee shop. So this is like the, this is the altar here, and you can come and have your, sip your coffee while we worship God together. This was a place marking and honoring God, a designated place recognizing God had appeared to him. Preeminently, by the way, a factor that I'm sure is seen in the big picture, it's the place of death. Marked as the place of God, but it's also the place of death. Sacrifices made there. So, Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now, we started following the path of faith. What happens when we forsake? Forsaking the path of faith. God said, go there. You know, a lot of times, let's bring it to where we are today. A lot of times, God is not speaking to us, by the way, like he did. It's very clear. But a lot of times, people will go to a place, and because they haven't received the thunderbolt revelation, they go on. They keep moving. Now, I just said a contradiction, because I said the tent is temporary. Be ready to move. But there are times when you must also stay and wait for God. Now, it's very clear right here, the forsaking begins because there was a famine in the land. God says, go to this place, and then there's a famine in the land. Now, if God is in control, God knows because he sent the famine. That's the other side of, I call it, our human idiocy. We fail to see that every time God ordered somebody to go somewhere, you don't think God didn't know there was a famine going on because he's the Lord of the land. Now, here comes the forsaking part. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, circle that word, because I'm using some, some F words, following, forsaking. Famine is part of that forsaking. Let's put flesh and blood on this, because there's some sitting here, you've heard this so many times, you'll say, yeah, 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 yeah. But what about in your life today? I know of at least probably a half a dozen families sitting here in the sanctuary who are experiencing some form of famine. Loss of job, diminished income, and you might say, well, this couldn't possibly be God's way. Sometimes God wants you to fade through the famine, because he's got something infinitely better at the end. Well, gosh, you sure don't know what I'm talking about. Well, read it right here. God said, go there, and sent Abram to a place where there was a famine. That's why I said, for you people who come and you seek for the blessing, those great teachings and teachers who are only going to tell you about the, the blessings and how to obtain them, probably are not preaching out of God's word to you, the pure word of God, because part of the blessing comes in the trial and tribulation of staying where God's told you to go. Abram, go to this land, and a famine sets in. Well, gee, this, we're just, we have to use some ingenuity here. Let's all go down to Egypt. Egypt is always, in Scripture, referred to as a, a we'll call it a type of sin, bondage, came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt 
that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look, up, look upon. You, I've always said this many times. If he was 75 when they left, she was 65. I think there was a 10-year difference between them. At any rate, uh, she was the hottest old lady in, in the Old Testament. <laughs> Just keeping it real. He says, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife. They'll kill me, but they'll save thee alive. Say, I pray thee that thou art my sister. Just say you're my sister. Now, you get familiar with these things, but I, I always envision a couple, I can't help it, they probably had gray hair or white hair. I envision what the patriarch might have looked like. I envision what she might have looked like. But I still can't get beyond the fact that he says, say you're my sister. Okay. Say, I pray that thou art my sister, that it be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So we have famine. We have falsehood. Just keep building. We might get to some other letters in the alphabet. It came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her, commanded her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. He entreated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, he asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. And it's safe to say that here, somewhere in their journeys, that they picked up Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid that would become the mother of the child they were trying to have by their own works. Ishmael, rather than waiting on the child of promise. Boy, I navigated that one good. <laughs> and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why did, why did you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So I might have taken her unto me to wife, and that's probably a clean version of what he was suggesting. Now, therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commended his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. And if you want to continue down the pathway of famine, falsehood, here's the failure. And this is what's interesting. I've tried to say this over many weeks. God knows our frailty. He knows our shortcomings. He knows we would probably prefer to go the easy way than the hard way. And yet, with all of this, here's a man who lied. He didn't trust God. In fact, probably for most people say, see, he didn't carry out God's word. He wasn't obedient. Hebrew says he obeyed. Well, he obeyed the call to leave his place where he lived. At least in part, that's a good beginning, though. But his failure here is interesting because in spite of his failure, God still is going to direct his path. And that's what I think is very significant. You can read this many, many times, and each time you'll find some new way of looking at this, what we've read and studied for years. And this time I'm thinking, you know, in the big picture of things, yeah, if following the path of faith is tough, forsaking that pathway is quite easy, especially when things get tough. How many of you know that by experience? When things get tough, it's much easier to try and solve the problem on your own than it is to wait on God. And then I, I have been guilty of this many times, where there has been a famine in my life and I'm speaking of the recent few years, and I decided it's much easier for me to try and solve the problem than it is to wait on God because God couldn't possibly know that there's a famine in my life. Ooh. If we say we have our being in Him, it's interesting that how quickly we can deny that we have our being in Him by saying He must not know or He doesn't care because otherwise He wouldn't let this happen. No. I've said many times, the famine comes to teach us how to depend on him. When we call out his name and we say he's the Lord who provides, well, how do you know he provides if you've never had to depend on him for provision? 
Would you need faith if everything was laid out, if, if the roadmap of your life was, you are here. Now, the little GPS voice says, now take a right turn at the next exit, and the whole thing was laid out for you. You wouldn't need any faith. Now, driving with me, you need faith, because I have a GPS, but I turned the volume down. That requires some faith, especially when you end up in the other part of town where you weren't supposed to be. Anybody want to ride with me? <laughs> That's what I admire about coming back to these passages. They humble us. They let us know that even when we think we know the crystal path of faith, that following it sometimes is not easy. That when the famine comes, God may be sending it. Sometimes it's to test us to see if we'll really lean on him. Sometimes I think people forget that it's very easy to, uh, especially in the case of Abram here, uh, he would prefer his own life over protecting his wife. The falsehoods come. Now we in the modern realm, we spend a lot of time probably lying to ourselves about the condition and the state of affairs rather than just looking to God and saying, God, help me. I'm in a famine. I've bleeped up pretty bad, and I need your help to get out of here. Instead, we try to figure out how to, how to get out of the place. Now here, it says, Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, all that he had, and I like the addition, and Lot with him. See, Lot was with him in Egypt, and I think that's kind of funny. Lot was with him. Lot was with him. Lot went with him. Lot, Lot, Lot. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. He went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, house of God, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. And interestingly enough, if you follow his journey from coming out of Ur and follow that pathway, and then follow down. That's a mighty bunch of miles he racked up for a 75-year-old man. I'm not sure exactly the distance. It's a couple hundred miles to Heron, and it's a couple hundred miles south, and then back up. And he went back to the first place. And that's what I like. The instructions are pretty clear. When you get off, of following the path of faith. Don't try and start solving the problem yourself. Get back to the first place where you started. The New Testament, the book of Revelation, we hear about those people who have fallen by the wayside, if you will, and God says, repent. You've left your first works, repent. You've left your first love, rather. Repent and do your first works over. The message can't be repeated enough. Will you and will I ever get it in our head that when we get off track with God, rather than thinking, well, you know, until I can forgive myself. By the way, I had a conversation with somebody over this very thing. Until I can forgive myself, I won't get back in God's program. Do you know the minute we say, I can't forgive myself, we have taken our eyes off of Christ and off of his finished work? When you say, I can't forgive myself, it means you have not only refused God's grace, but you've taken your eyes completely off him because if you were looking at him, you would say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Instead, the eyes are looking internally and saying, me. These are important lessons because there's enough of you here and enough of you listening to me at home who have done this, and you've said, but I just can't forgive myself. And the minute you utter those words, you are saying, I've taken my eyes off of Christ. I know he forgives, but I'm looking at me now. I've got my eyes on me. I don't dare look up. Well, the instructions to Abraham eventually are going to be to look up, to lift up his eyes. So just as a footnote for those people that say, I've been too much of a failure, you get back to the first place, just like this. Get back to the house of God. You get back to the place of the sacrifice, to the altar. You get back to that first place. Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. That's the second thing. Not enough to just return to the first place and say, I'm, Lord, I'm back. But you begin to talk to him and call on his name. You know, it's a simple, simple message. 
but it's so needful because we all do the same thing. I don't care how long you've walked with God. I don't care if I'm your pastor or if you're here for the first time. We've all done this. We get so familiar that when we get off track, we fail to recognize what we ought to do. You get back to the place where you started, the house of God. You call upon his name. The New Testament says, all who call upon his name shall be saved. There isn't a soul who has called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that has not been a recipient of his grace, washed by his blood, and set free from the life of sin and bondage that they may have been held in. So here it's the same thing. The steps are very clear. And here's Lot again, and Lot also, <sighs> which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Now, let me just say again, I can take lessons, and I could probably do on each verse, I could do a lesson. This is a very important lesson, considering Lot was a good-for-nothing barnacle hanger-on that went everywhere and held on to his tailcoats, and he says, let's not fight. Now, I'm not telling you that we're able to live peaceably with each other in the real world, because we're not. And if we're at all honest, most of the time we walk around griping about somebody else's issues they have with us or that we have with them. But here's a perfect example, by the way, going back to the house of God, calling on the name of the Lord, and then even saying to his brother, I don't want there to be strife. Let's not fight. Now, some of these are not always the crystal clear picture of our life, but they give the pathway. You know, I really believe, I preached that message on forgiveness, I really believe this with all my heart. I've come to know it so well. I, I, this is not a subjective thing. The Word declares it abundantly. If we walk around with bitterness, it is the root that poisons the soul. You walk around long enough with lingering things against people who have wronged you and done malice, I'm telling you something, it will kill you. It will kill you spiritually. And please don't say, I don't know what you've been through. You're right, and you don't know what I've been through. And for me to say this out of this mouth, from this heart, is a very large thing, considering the things that have been done to me. But I'm telling you something. It'll kill you. And the picture here of Abram talking to Lot and saying, let there be no strife. Again, another New Testament picture. That if you have aught against your brother, if your brother have, if there's any contention, between brethren, and you go directly to that one. I mean, we could, I could take lessons, pages out of the New Testament and say, see, right here. But the lesson's abundantly clear. Here's the rest of it, verse 9. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east. They separated themselves one from another. Let me stop right there, because Lot represents most Christians. I hate to say that. You go, oh boy, that's a slap in the face. Lot represents most Christians. I want a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I want here the well-watered plains, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, like the garden of the Lord, likened to the garden of the Lord, but with all the goodness of the land of Egypt. I want, I want to have a one foot here and one foot there. And I've told you my famous canoe story, but it's worth telling again. It's the only time as a child I was sent away to a camp. This is how I know you can't have everything. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It's, it's a lie. It's a conspiracy. The kids were telling me, come on, get in the canoe. I couldn't understand what they were saying because I had a language problem. Get in the canoe. And I didn't understand what they were saying. So I saw that they were motioning me. I had one foot in the canoe and one foot on the dock. And 
things started to separate like that, not only did I go in the water, but all the people in the canoe flipped over too. It never works. Don't try it at home, it never works. All I can tell you is that is exactly Lot. Give me this picturesque, like the garden of God, but with all the good stuff of Egypt. Give me the best of both worlds. I don't want to have to give up Egypt. You notice that Egypt is still in the mix, like the land of Egypt. And of course, I could go down the path of telling you Lot's choice shows what was truly in Lot's mind and heart, because if you begin to follow Lot's journey, he first journeys to the east, and then if you're reading his whole story, he puts up his tent, and it's a little closer to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he gets a little bit closer, and he gets a little bit closer, and soon enough, he's sitting right in the gate of that place. Now, if Lot chose that, what appeared to be that good land, it says, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. The men of Sodom were were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And if I just stop there, you might say, well, but at least Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. That's not so bad because that's where God told him to go. But if you understand the lay of the land, where Abraham was, if you were to look at where he stayed, it wasn't that picturesque. It did not appear as a land yet flowing with milk and honey or anything. It did not appear to the eye. In fact, probably rocky, very, very sandy and dirty, and I say dirty as in earthy, not at all like where Lot went. And the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him, and only after, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And I'd have you just put a note there, because I, when I taught on this the last time, my Bible's marked up enough. God says, lift up and look, both a simple act, but both imperatively, that God's commanding Abram to lift up his eyes and look. And God's still speaking to us today the same thing. Some of you who are in the mode, what I call the hangdog mode, though, you know, I just spoke of that, you know, the internal, I can't lift my eyes, I can't lift my head, I'm so ashamed, I can't do anything, I've been a failure, I've forsaken God, I was on the path, but I fell away, just everything that's down. Hear the message today, lift up now thine eyes, look from the place where you are, and in Abram's case, all the place, north, south, east, and west, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it into thy seed. And here comes the uh, reaffirmation of the promise that God said he would. Now, I know what happens. We get to this and we think, yes, and God said to Abraham, lift up now thine eyes and look around. But I've, when I taught on this the last time, it really dawned on me that what Abraham might have been doing at the time that God said, lift up now thine eyes, he might have been standing there on a patch of dirt that didn't look like very much. Abram, not yet Abraham, Abram, on a patch of dirt, looking down and thinking, oh my, this is the promise? Wow, I think I got a bad deal. Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that that's so, but I really believe when God said, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where you are, and that's what we need to do today. I think this church has been through enough episodes of halting and stopping. And some, by the way, in their halting, I believe, have spiritually died because they refuse to go on God's program. But for us who are, I, begin, I go back to the beginning, who are slightly nervous in the stomach about tomorrow, afraid, by the way, God's not the author of fear, but worried about the instability and the inconsistencies in this life of faith and how could this all come together. The message applies to us today. Lift up your eyes. If you've been downcast, like the psalmist said, why are you downcast? 
lift up your eyes. The psalmist also had the wisdom to know that his countenance was illuminated by looking Godward. Lift up your eyes today. If you're sitting here in the sanctuary saying, I don't know what hit me, especially to those of you when I read your letters and prayer requests who say, I've lost my job or I've lost my home or my life is falling apart. Have you considered, and I'm not suggesting that God is a sadist, but have you considered the fact that the famine in your life, whatever it may be, God is saying, I want you to stay there and keep trusting and faithing on me and I'll bring you out instead of trying to solve the problem. And by the way, I love the fact that following this path included the grace of showing how forsaking included all of the things that I've depicted, and yet God still said, the promise is still good unto you. The promise is still good unto you, failure. The promise is still good unto you after you have forsaken me. The promise is still good unto you when you can't find your way. The promise is still good unto you to this church and to you as individuals. I sometimes think we get so comfortable with these words that we forget they're mine. The famine that I've experienced, and I, I won't go into detail, but the famine that I've, I've experienced, I've asked God every single day, Lord, the church, I don't care what else happens, the church, the church. Oh, I've got big dreams and I'd like to achieve certain things for the church, but the church, the health of the church, the well-being of the church, the people who are the church, Lord, I feel sometimes like this church has been in Heron too long, and if we haven't been in Heron, we've been in famine. And then I think maybe the Lord, oh, no, it has to be that there's some other reason somehow. I've got to justify. You know what I'm talking about? Where you begin to rationalize instead of saying, I'm going to trust. God gave a promise. I'll give you a little hint about something. The message I had prepared was about the God who amends his word. And that is the God we serve. He gives his word, and he doesn't give his word to just say, well, maybe it'll work out. But he gives his word to those who will actually run, grab, and take hold, and appropriate it, and live as if God said it. I am grabbing hold. This is my lifeline. The promise to Abram was, you see this land? I'm going to give it to you. And your descendants, and we keep going and saying the descendants will be as the, the sand and the dust. And the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says exactly that for your father Abraham, and you are the seed indeed. So when I look to this, I only think the promise made good to Abraham, made good by God. But I also think for those of us who are in the state today of looking down, downcast, and we can't figure out this, this, this pilgrimage is driving me crazy. You know what I'm saying? I want, I, want the, I want the GPS version of this trip that guides me. I don't want to have to trust blindly that God is going to order my steps. But the minute I start to walk, I realize if I had all this laid out, I wouldn't need God and I wouldn't need faith. And suddenly the reality kicks in. Lift up now thine eyes. Quit looking down. I speak first to me. Quit looking at the circumstance and thinking, this is it. You know, I, I look at you and I see your faces and I think, this is, you are all my family, my spiritual family. I, I see familiar, most of you familiar faces. Don't, please don't be offended when I say this. Lord, is this it? <laughs> What I, wait a minute, wait a minute. What I mean. <laughs> Lord, supposedly the family of God here, and I say supposedly we are that, and I see the struggles of some. You'll understand now when I say, you carnal ones, I think, is this it? Like, oh, this is it? The struggle of some with loss of employment, the struggle of some with their spouses being so crippled up in pain that they can barely move, those who are bound in wheelchairs, who have been praying for years to be 
freed from the chair to walk again. Those with blind eyes. I'm speaking of people in this sanctuary. I'm not talking to the people I can't see. I'm talking to those in the sanctuary. Blind eyes that, Lord. That's why I said, is this it? Some of you interpret it like I'm saying on you. No, I'm saying, Lord, is this it for your people? Or are you going to make good on your word? And then I recognize it starts with me lifting up my eyes. Now, not an hour from now, not tomorrow, right now, and beginning to stand on the promise, whatever your promise is that you need to stand on and say, if God sent the famine, he will also send the plenty. And the famine was sent for a good reason. I said there were 13 famines in the Bible that God sent, 13 of them in Genesis alone. Famine in your life today? Don't go down to Egypt. Don't go looking for the solution. Stand firm, knowing this temporary housing, the tent, is only temporary. And the altars that we've placed along the way, those are markers, by the way, to find our way back when indeed we forsake and quit doing and quit acting the life of faith. So if somebody were to say to me today, did you come today with a, a little bit of a knot in your stomach? Of course. And the reason for me is simple. I said to you, it's the church. The church, the church, the church. I'm looking at the singers here, and I think the church. And I'm looking at the choir pit, and I'm thinking the church. And I'm looking at families who need healing and help, the church. And then I think, now, for me and for you, lift up now thine eyes, not from, whoa, when I get there, when I get to where I need to go, then I'll look up. No, right now, and especially for those of you that I, I think I've called your number adequately, the ones that are so downcast in their spirit, they can't even lift their head up. Ask you a question. Do you think Abram, knowing, or maybe not knowing, but that Lot took what appeared to be the better part, do you think he stood there thinking, now, this is what I'm left with? Did he think, Wow, this is what I'm left with. I doubt it. And that's why God said, lift up now thine eyes. And I'm saying to you today, lift up now, right now, from the place where you're at, and recognize that all the promises of God are yours to claim in Christ Jesus, that if your issue is anything that I've said, following the path of faith is tough, forsaking it is even tougher. And if you've fallen off the path, his grace is sufficient. Find your way back to the place you started at, calling on the name of the God that you have come to know as the God of your salvation, and start all over again. But for us right now today as a church, I'm going to ask you afresh, even if this is the thousandth time you've heard this message and you say, I know it all too well, will you, from the place where you're at, even if there is still the unknown in front of you and you still don't know, exactly, well, I'm going to take this road and this road and this road, but rather, I can't see, but the Lord will lead me. Will you just stand firm on his word and say, the promise to Abram is also mine now from the place where you're at, in pain, in trouble with your finances, whatever your issues are, lift up now your eyes and say, the promise of God that I claim today, whatever it is, and claim it with full faith knowing if God gave the promise to Abraham, we are sons and daughters as well. The promises apply to us. They're in Christ. We claim them together. Stand firm on that. Let fear and let everything else that contradicts God's word be a lie and say, I rebuke that. I'm going to do exactly what I know to do, which is keep on walking the life of faith. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.